This is a summary video for AQA GCSE Biology Paper 1, which covers cells, organisation, infection and bioenergetics. This video gives you an overview of everything on the paper, although not in a huge amount of detail, otherwise it would be far too long. This video will allow you to do a last minute cram on the night before your GCSE exams. If you're taking GCSE Combined Science, then watch out for the pink headings whenever there's triple science content to skip, or use the timestamps in the description below so you know when to fast forward to. The first part of AQA GCSE Biology or Combined Science is all about cells. We start with eukaryotic cells, cells that contain a true nucleus, like these animal and plant cells. Eukaryotic cells consist of a cell membrane wrapped around cytoplasm and they contain a nucleus, a little pack of DNA wrapped in a membrane. They also contain ribosomes, where protein is made, which are drawn quite large here but in reality are too small and transparent to see with a light microscope, and mitochondria, which are about the same size as a bacterium. In addition, plant cells and the cells of algae have a cell wall made from cellulose, a polymer of glucose, green chloroplasts full of chlorophyll, which absorb light for photosynthesis, and a permanent vacuole full of cell sap. You need to know the functions or jobs of each of these subcellular structures or organelles. So as we've said, the nucleus contains the DNA or genetic material, and it's also responsible for controlling the actions of the cell. The cytoplasm is the liquid jelly where most of the chemical reactions in the cell take place. The cell membrane is responsible for controlling what can go into and out of the cell. It acts a little bit like a bouncer. Ribosomes are used to synthesize protein, while mitochondria are the site for aerobic respiration, which is used to release energy. The cell wall that plants have is made of cellulose and it strengthens and gives the cell support. The chloroplasts absorb light and are where photosynthesis takes place. And then finally, the permanent vacuole is a storage of cell sap, and this is used to keep the cell rigid to support the plant. Prokaryotes, such as bacteria, don't have a nucleus. In fact, they lack any membrane-bound subcellular structures, so they don't have a nucleus, but they also don't have mitochondria or chloroplasts. Their DNA exists as a single circular chromosome, although some bacteria may also have small circles of DNA called plasmids, and these contain genes for things like antibiotic resistance, and they can be passed between bacteria in a process called conjugation. Another difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the size of their ribosomes. Those in eukaryotes are significantly bigger. If you're taking triple biology, then you need to know that bacteria reproduce by binary fission. Binary fission is just a special name for mitosis when it occurs in a single-celled organism or in a subcellular structure. This means that the bacteria can rapidly increase in numbers, with division times often as short as 20 minutes, provided they have sufficient nutrients and a suitable temperature. So if you start out with one bacteria, then after 20 minutes you'll have two, after 40 minutes you'll have four, after 60 minutes you'll have eight, and they just keep on doubling. An hour later you've got 64, an hour after that you've got 512, and by the time you get to four hours you have 4096 bacteria. You may be given a maths related question in which you're asked to work out how many bacteria will be present after a certain amount of time or a certain number of generations, or equally you might be asked to figure out how long it takes for a certain bacterial population to arise. Bacteria can be cultured or grown as colonies, either in a petri dish filled with a mixture of agar jelly and LB nutrient broth, which contains glucose and amino acids and other nutrients that the bacteria need, or in a tube of the same broth, depending on whether we want distinct colonies or just a large number of the bacteria. In both instances, the bacteria need sufficient nutrients and also a permissive temperature. For instance, in industry, we culture E. coli at 37 degrees. These bacteria can then be used for investigating the action of disinfectants and antibiotics, as you do in the required practical. When making a streak plate, it's important that the petri dish, culture media and inoculating loop are all sterilised, so that the only bacteria you culture are the ones from your sample. This can be done by autoclaving them under high temperature and pressure, or in the case of the inoculating loop, by passing it through a Bunsen burner flame. You then use the inoculating loop, once it's cooled down of course, to put a small amount of the bacterial sample onto the agar plate and spread it in a zigzag pattern, separating the individual bacteria. It's important that after you're done, the lid is taped down, but only using small pieces of adhesive tape, not sealing up the whole thing, so oxygen can still get in. If the bacteria start anaerobically respiring, then they often make poisonous secondary metabolites. <laughs> 
the plate is stored upside down to prevent condensation that forms on the lid from falling onto the bacterial colonies. In school, we incubate the bacteria at 25 degrees C. This is because any human pathogens that have been ending up on the plate by accident will grow best at a temperature close to body temperature. So by keeping the temperature quite a lot cooler than this, we avoid growing those pathogens while still allowing the bacteria that we want to culture to grow. As you know, 10% of the marks on GCSE biology papers are for math skills at a GCSE maths level. So since well-separated bacterial colonies grow in nice circles, you could be asked to measure the radius of one of these colonies and then use pi r squared to calculate the area of the bacterial colony. The zone of inhibition test can be used to determine the antimicrobial properties of antibiotics, chemical antiseptics, and even natural antiseptics like garlic. Rather than using a streak plate, you use an agar plate that is totally covered with a bacterial culture. Each antiseptic is introduced in the form of a little paper disc soaked in that chemical. We use one disc soaked in water as a control. This is sort of like a placebo. It allows us to say with confidence that the bacteria didn't just die because we put a wet piece of paper on them. It was the actual chemical that did the work. We then measure the area around each paper disc where no bacteria are growing anymore because the antiseptic has killed them off. This is called the zone of inhibition and the bigger it is, the better the antiseptic works. Now, backing up a little way to those eukaryotic cells, cells can be specialised and this means that they're adapted structurally to suit their function. This can involve change in shape or the presence of more or fewer subcellular structures. For instance, a sperm cell has a tail to help it to move, and it's also packed with mitochondria because that movement requires a lot of energy. A nerve cell has a very branched shape, and this allows one neuron to communicate with hundreds of others. You'll also see muscle cells packed with mitochondria for energy, and ribosomes for synthesising protein. In animals, this specialisation of cells happens very, very early in development. Plants specialise much later, and they also retain unspecialised meristem cells throughout their lifetime, which is why you can clone a whole new plant from a very small piece of an old plant. In terms of specialised cells, you could think about the palisade cells in the leaf, which have lots of extra chloroplasts for absorbing light energy, or the cells involved in transport. Root hair cells contain no chloroplasts because they're under the ground, so they can't photosynthesise because there's no light. They also have an extended shape to increase their surface area, and this will maximise their absorbance of both water and minerals. The xylem and phloem are the plant equivalents of veins and arteries. The xylem transport water and mineral ions from the roots up to the leaves in a process called transpiration. They're made out of dead cells, which are reinforced with a woody material called lignin, and there are no divisions within each vessel. Basically, you just have a thin, hollow tube where the cell wall at the end of each cell has disintegrated and broken apart. The phloem transports sugar, specifically a sugar called sucrose that we don't really talk about in GCSE, and they move that sugar from the leaves where it's made as part of photosynthesis all around the plant in an active process called translocation. This requires a lot of energy, but it's much faster than diffusion. The phloem are made from living cells, and these cells each have sort of an extra cell stuck onto them called a companion cell. And that companion cell is doing a lot of the work for them, so they can just concentrate on moving things. In between the different cells of the phloem tube are something called sieve tube elements. So it's not just one continuous tube. Basically, the cell wall at the end of each cell is perforated to allow materials to flow between the cells by going through those gaps. Since we're talking about xylem and transpiration, we might as well mention that the best conditions for transpiration are what you would think of as good laundry weather. When it's hot, dry, light, and there's lots of air movement, transpiration will happen quickly. This is because when it's warm, the water molecules have more energy, so they move faster and they evaporate more quickly. When it's dry outside, there's a steeper concentration gradient from the water in the plant leaf to the dry air. The presence of wind or an air current will move water away from the plant, so therefore it maintains that concentration gradient and the water will keep on moving out of the plant. And when it's light, the plant wants to do more photosynthesis or it's able to do more photosynthesis, and therefore it needs to keep its stomata open in order to get the reactants, in order to get the carbon dioxide in but this also means that water can move out as part of transpiration. Now, if we go back slightly to those specialised cells, 
all specialised cells are originally derived from unspecialised or undifferentiated cells called stem cells. As an adult human you have relatively few stem cells and the ones that you do have are quite limited in that they can only become a few different types of cell. So for instance in your bone marrow you have stem cells that can become red blood cells or white blood cells but they can't become a neuron. And that means that while it's really useful that you can produce new blood cells throughout your lifetime, those stem cells from your bone marrow couldn't be used to treat paralysis by growing a new nerve if you'd severed your spinal cord. In contrast to that, the stem cells that are found in embryos are able to differentiate to become pretty much any other kind of specialised cell. And so these are more useful for treating conditions such as paralysis and also diabetes. In therapeutic cloning, an embryo is made that has the same genes as the patient. And that's really important because it means if those stem cells are then harvested and used to treat the patient, they won't be rejected because they're basically genetically the same as the patient. And that means that the patient won't have to take immunosuppressant drugs, which would make them more susceptible to infectious diseases. On the other hand, there are some ethical issues involved here. The embryo obviously can't consent, and is it okay to bring an embryo into the world only to destroy it once you've taken its stem cells? Additionally, there's the issue that um, embryonic stem cell treatment can lead to viral transfer. Now, plants, as we say, have meristems, which contain stem cells that can become any kind of cell, and that's why it's possible to really easily clone plants using cuttings. This is really useful for helping to conserve endangered species or to produce large numbers of a particular plant, such as a disease-resistant crop. Next, we talk about microscopy, the science of making things look bigger so that we can study them. You should know that resolution is the smallest measurement that you can make, whereas magnification is how much bigger the image looks than the actual object. You can think of this like taking a zoomed-in photo with a phone camera. Often you can zoom in 10 or 20 times, but the image is blurry because the resolution isn't high enough. There are two types of microscopes that you need to know about, light microscopes and electron microscopes. Light microscopes have existed since the 16th century, and they give us a basic understanding of cells by focusing light through lenses, but they can't show us things that are below a certain size. Their magnification maxes out at around 1500 times, although your best school compound microscopes probably can't magnify more than 400 times. And for the very best microscopes, their resolution might be as good as 0.2 micrometers. You won't see a ribosome using a light microscope because they're just too small, and also because they're transparent. You should know that the light microscopes you use in school are compound microscopes. In other words, they have two lenses, an eyepiece lens and an objective lens. You multiply their magnifications together to get the overall magnification. There are two types of electron microscope, scanning electron microscopes and transmission electron microscopes, and both of them have a much greater magnification and resolution because they use a beam of electrons rather than a ray of light. So we can see things that are much smaller and we can also see them in greater detail. The magnification of an electron microscope can be as good as 500,000 times, and the resolution can be as good as a single nanometer. In biology, this means we can view mitochondria and even the ultrastructure of subcellular structures, but in chemistry, electron microscopes can also be used to visualise nanoparticles, which are only a few hundred atoms. Here's another opportunity for some maths, working out the magnification of an image or the actual size of an object from its image, given its magnification. I very rarely advocate the use of triangles because it's just another thing for you to remember, but for me, I am is quite memorable, so this is pretty much the only one I do use. If you can remember this triangle, just cover up one of the three letters and use the remainder to give you an equation. So if I'm calculating magnification, I need to take the size of the image, that's the picture on the exam paper that you've measured with a ruler, and divide it by the size of the object, that's the thing in the picture which you may have to work out using a scale bar. Remember, the equation will only work if your units are the same for both measurements. So if one is in millimetres and the other one is in micrometres, you'll need to convert. All of your unit conversions involve multiplying or dividing by a thousand. There are a thousand micrometers in a millimeter and a thousand nanometers in a micrometer. There's a required practical about light microscopy. You should be able to describe the method, how you start with the stage as high as possible using the lowest power objective lens, focus firstly with the coarse focusing wheel and then with a fine focus. You then switch to a more powerful objective lens if you need to and focus using just the fine lens. You'll need to talk about how a stain is used to allow you to see the transparent components of the cell, and you'll also need to be able to troubleshoot. If an image is out of focus, you use the focusing wheels to bring it into focus. If it's too small for you to see clearly, you need a higher power objective lens. 
If you can't see an image at all, it could be that the lamp isn't turned on or that the objective lens isn't fully in position. Next, you need to know about cell division. And in order to know about cell division, it's helpful to have a quick look at the hierarchy. Within a eukaryotic cell, there's a nucleus. And within the nucleus, there are chromosomes, 23 pairs in a human body cell. Each chromosome, containing about a thousand different genes, is made of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. That DNA is going to be important when we get to paper two and the genetics topic, but it's also relevant to mitosis, one of the two types of cell division. Mitosis, which is used by body cells for growth and repair, usually comes up in paper one, although sometimes it puts in an appearance in paper two. Don't get it confused with meiosis, which is used to make gametes and which usually comes up in paper two. Basically, if cell division is happening anywhere in the body except for the ovaries or the testicles, it's mitosis. Also be very, very careful with your spelling. There's maybe four pairs of words in biology where any ambiguity will cost you the mark and mitosis and meiosis is one of them. Mitosis occurs as part of the normal cell cycle. Following interphase, where the cell grows and undertakes normal metabolism, there's a DNA replication phase where all of the DNA is copied. Then the chromosomes are pulled to opposite ends of the cell and the cell divides once, producing two diploid daughter cells that are both identical to the original cell they were made from. Mitosis makes clones. The next topic is about transport of materials, and we start with diffusion, which is a passive process, which means that it doesn't require any energy. Diffusion is the overall movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We say overall movement because the particles don't stop moving when the system reaches equilibrium, but now they're going back and forth at the same rate, so there's overall no more change. If you want to, when describing diffusion, you can use the phrase down a concentration gradient, but make sure you're saying down, not across or along, because those are wrong. Diffusion occurs in both gases and solutions, and it can occur either with or without a membrane. As an example here, you can see these oxygen molecules diffusing from outside the cell, where there are lots of them, to inside the cell, where there are few. Diffusion is important in both animals and plants. For instance, urea diffuses from cells into the blood plasma, and oxygen diffuses from the lungs into the bloodstream, while carbon dioxide diffuses in the opposite direction. Within the plant spongy mesophyll, carbon dioxide will also diffuse through the leaf. Certain tissues, such as the lungs, small intestine, and gills in fish, are adapted to improve the speed with which diffusion can occur. Having a large surface area means there are more places for the molecules to be absorbed, so tissues like the alveoli in the lungs or the villi in the small intestine have a folded structure to increase this, and the villi even have microvilli, so each cell has little extra projections to increase the surface area even more. By only having a thin membrane, there's less distance for the absorbed substances to travel, and having a good blood supply like a strong capillary network or good ventilation in the lungs will help to maintain that concentration gradient so the substance keeps moving. This also happens in plants, as we've seen already. Root hair cells have a very large surface area too. Speaking of surface area, there's a bit of crossover here with the chemistry GCSE about how cutting an object into smaller pieces or giving it folds gives it a bigger surface area to volume ratio, and that will always speed up transport and also chemical reactions. It's not that the smaller pieces have a bigger surface area, it's that the whole volume taken together now has a bigger surface area. So if you look at my cube here on the left, it has a total volume of 64 centimetres cubed and a surface area of 96 centimetres squared. Whereas if I cut it in half in all three dimensions to make eight smaller cubes, then the volume is still the same because it's the same material, I've just broken it up. But the surface area of all of the cubes put together is now 192 centimetres squared. In other words, by cutting it in half on all three dimensions, I've doubled the surface area to volume ratio. Osmosis is like diffusion, but it's the water that moves, and also, crucially, it moves across a partially permeable membrane. That's a membrane that will allow water to move, but not the solutes that are dissolved in the water. You can basically take your diffusion definition and add in of water after high concentration and low concentration, but some people find that confusing, so I tend to stick to talking about dilute solutions and concentrated solutions. Osmosis is the diffusion of water from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution through a partially permeable membrane. You have to bear in mind that the water is moving to balance out the solutes, so when the process is finished, there won't be the same amount of water everywhere, 
there'll be more water wherever there was more solute to begin with. In the required practical for osmosis, you would have investigated putting pieces of a vegetable, usually a potato, into solutions of different concentrations of sugar or salt or some other solute. As with all of the required practicals, you should know your variables. The independent variable is the concentration of the solution, the dependent variable is the change in mass or the change in length of the cylinder, and the control variables would include things like the type of vegetable material, so if you're using potato for one tube, you use potato for all the tubes, the size of the cylinder, and the length of time that the cylinders were left for. If the solution contains more water than the tissue fluid in the cells, then the water will move into the plant cells to dilute them, and the cylinder will get bigger. If the solution contains less water, in other words, it's more concentrated and less dilute, then water will be sucked out of the plant cells and they will shrivel and shrink. This will make your potato cylinder get shorter, which you can measure with a ruler, and also lighter, which you can measure by weighing it. If the potato doesn't change mass or doesn't change size, that tells you that the solution it's in has the same concentration as the fluid in its cells. It's important if you're weighing your cylinders rather than measuring their length that you dry them thoroughly first, as otherwise you'll just end up including the mass of the water, which would make your values inaccurate. Here's another opportunity for some maths, working out the percentage change in mass of the piece of potato. First, you work out the absolute change. In other words, how many grams has the mass changed by? And then you divide this by the starting mass and you multiply by 100 to get a percentage. You can think of active transport as being like the opposite of diffusion. It's the overall movement of particles from a low to a high concentration with the use of carrier proteins and the energy from respiration. You therefore expect to see that tissues that do a lot of active transport have lots and lots of mitochondria to respire aerobically and provide them with this energy. We see active transport anywhere that tissues are trying to absorb more than 50% of a particular nutrient. So for instance in plant roots where root hair cells absorb mineral ions like magnesium and nitrate, and in the villi of the small intestines where sugar is absorbed into the bloodstream. In both these scenarios it allows the organism to absorb over 50% of the available nutrients, which is all they would be able to get using diffusion alone. The second topic in GCSE Biology Paper 1 is organisation, and although we've discussed this a little bit as part of Unit 1, talking about things smaller than cells, we also need to be able to talk about things bigger than cells. You should know that cells are the basic building blocks of all living organisms, and that a tissue is a group of cells that have a similar structure and function, so lots of different cells of one type all working together. Where you have multiple different tissues that perform a specific function together, we call that an organ, like the heart or the lungs or the pancreas, and then organs may be organised into organ systems, like the digestive system and the circulatory system, which work together to form organisms. Now, you're probably quite familiar with the idea when it comes to animals, but plants can be a bit less familiar. So if we take a whole plant, we can break that down into organs like leaves, stems, roots and flowers. And then if we take, say, a leaf as an example, we can break that down further into tissues. The first part of the leaf is the waxy cuticle on top, and this isn't actually a living tissue, it's literally a layer of wax which prevents water loss from the plant. Beneath the waxy cuticle is a transparent layer called the epidermis, or the epidermal layer, and the reason it's transparent is to allow maximum light to get through to the palisade mesophyll layer. Mesophyll literally means the middle of the leaf and the palisade layer is specialised by having extra chloroplasts to absorb light energy, and it's where the majority of photosynthesis happens. Below the palisade mesophyll is the spongy mesophyll, which has gas spaces to allow oxygen and carbon dioxide and water vapour to diffuse through the leaf, and embedded within the spongy mesophyll are vascular bundles, which are made up of xylem and phloem, and these are responsible for the movement of water and sugar, respectively, in transpiration and translocation. At the bottom of the leaf, there's another epidermal layer, and within this, there are stomata, those pores that allow gas exchange to happen. And we should probably say that there are some stomata in the top epidermal layer as well, but just far, far fewer of them. Each stoma, or stomal pore, is surrounded on either side by a pair of guard cells. Guard cells are the pairs of cells responsible for keeping a particular stoma open or closed based on how well hydrated the plant is. When there's a lot of water available, the plant uses energy and active transport to pump ions into the guard cells. This causes water to move in by osmosis, and the cells become full of water and turgid, and this will lead the stoma to be open. When there's less water available, the water moves out of the guard cells and they become flaccid or shrunken and shriveled, and the stoma pore closes up 
and this prevents further transpiration from happening and stops the plant from becoming any more dehydrated. You should also be able to use the human digestive system as a case study for an organ system. You need to be able to label the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestines, and also the liver and pancreas, which are responsible for producing other chemicals that are important in the digestion of food. The purpose of digestion is to turn large, insoluble food molecules, which can't dissolve, into smaller, soluble food molecules that can be absorbed through the small intestine. It's vital for digestion that your cells are able to make enzymes. These are biological catalysts, molecules that can speed up the rate of reactions like respiration, photosynthesis and digestion without being used up or changed themselves. They're made out of protein, so any cell that needs to make enzymes will contain lots of ribosomes. Each enzyme is specific. This means it has a particular shape and its active site fits exactly the shape of the substrate that it interacts with. It's possible for the enzyme to be denatured and stop working if its active site is permanently bent out of shape by extremes of temperature or pH. The human body makes thousands of different enzymes, but when talking about the digestive system, you need to be able to discuss three groups of them. Each of them has a name that ends with the suffix "-ase", which indicates that it's an enzyme. Amylase is an example of a carbohydrase, in other words, a type of enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. It specifically breaks down the carbohydrate starch into sugar, incidentally not glucose. For that you need another enzyme called maltase which you can learn about in sick form. Now in addition to being made in the pancreas and the small intestine, amylase is also made in the mouth. And the reason that you need two different versions of amylase is because the mouth has a neutral pH, so your salivary amylase has an optimum pH of about 7 but then you swallow it and it goes into your stomach where there's a very, very low pH. And so that initial amylase is denatured. And so then you need some more amylase to work in your small intestine. So the small intestine and pancreas both also make amylase. The second enzyme you need to know about are proteases, which break down protein into amino acids. As well as being made in the pancreas and the small intestine, they're also made in the stomach. And the stomach proteases have a very low optimum pH. Lipases are enzymes that can break down lipids, also known as fats and oils, and these are broken down into two monomers, fatty acids and glycerol. Again, lipase is made by the pancreas and the small intestine, and it works in the small intestine. In addition to these three groups of enzymes, there are two other chemicals that you need to know about. Bile is produced by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. It emulsifies fats by breaking apart large globules into much smaller droplets, enabling lipases to access more of the fat at once. It's also alkaline, so it neutralises the stomach acid to give the optimum pH for the enzymes that are working in the small intestine. The stomach also makes hydrochloric acid, which is responsible for giving the protease enzymes their optimum pH, and also for killing pathogenic bacteria. For the food test required practical, you need to be able to describe how to test for the presence of carbohydrates like starch and sugars, lipids and proteins. To test for starch, we use an orange-brown reagent called iodine solution, which turns blue-black in the presence of starch. To test for glucose, we boil the sample with Benedict solution. This starts out bright blue, but when reducing sugars are present, as it's boiled, it turns green, then yellow, then orange, and then eventually red, depending on how much sugar is present. To test for proteins, we use a different blue solution called burette reagent, and again, be very careful of this spelling as it will cost you marks. This turns a lilac purple colour if there's protein present. Now there isn't one named test for lipids in your specification, but you could describe using tracing paper for solid foods and looking for a greasy stain, or adding ethanol and water and shaking to produce a white emulsion if lipids are present. Link to the food test required practical is a further required practical where you investigate the optimum conditions for a particular enzyme to work. The optimum conditions are those where the enzyme is able to fastest catalyse the particular reaction that it works for. In this investigation, we test the speed with which amylase breaks down starch to make sugars, because the faster this happens, the closer it is to the optimum conditions. As we saw in the previous slide, we can test for the presence of starch using iodine solution, which in the presence of starch will be blue-black, but when there's no starch left will be orange-brown. We use a continuous sampling method. This means that every 30 seconds we'll take a new sample and see is there any starch left. Initially, you have several tubes, each containing starch and a pH buffer, which have been left in a water bath until they've reached a particular temperature, say 30 degrees. 
then you add the same amount of amylase to each one of those tubes and then every 30 seconds you remove a sample and add it to the iodine in the spotting tile to see whether or not there's still starch present has the enzyme done its job yet you're going to end up with a results table that looks something like this. So the ticks indicate that there is still starch present, whereas the crosses indicate that all of the starch has been digested and the reaction is over. So as you can see here at pH 7, the enzyme is working very, very quickly and all of the starch is broken down within the first 30 seconds. Whereas at pH 9 and pH 5, it's working a little more slowly. And at pH 2 and pH 12, it seems like the enzyme has been completely denatured because it's unable to break down the starch even after six minutes. Now, as part of this required practical, you might be asked about the control variables. And one of the things we need to control is the temperature. But remember, a control variable is something that you are actively taking charge of and doing something to force it to be exactly the same in every single repeat. So it's not enough to say that you would do the um, experiment at room temperature. We need to actually control the temperature by keeping the tubes of starch and amylase in a water bath or by warming them using an electric heater. You need to be able to identify and label a number of organs of the human body. For the lungs, you should label the trachea, which is the proper name for the windpipe, and this splits into two bronchi, one in each lung, which in turn split into bronchioles. These finally split into thousands of tiny alveoli, little cloud-like structures that give the lungs a bubbly texture and increase the surface area for gas exchange. Each alveolus is served by lots of capillaries to increase the rate of diffusion. Underneath the lungs, there's a thick sheath of muscle called the diaphragm. And when this moves downwards, it increases the volume of the thoracic cavity, leading the lungs to inflate. As part of the circulatory system, you should recognize three types of blood vessel. The arteries carry blood away from the heart under high pressure. So they have thick layers of both the muscle and the elastic tissue. The veins carry blood towards the heart and it's under lower pressure. So they have a larger lumen, which is the hole in the middle, and thinner walls, both the elastic tissue and the muscle. They also have valves to prevent backflow. The capillaries are the tiny little blood vessels that allow blood to get to every cell in your body. And they have walls that are just one cell thick. Human blood is made up of four key components. Red blood cells carry oxygen in the form of oxyhemoglobin. Their concave shape maximizes their surface area and they have no nucleus to allow more room for hemoglobin. White blood cells such as phagocytes and lymphocytes fight infection either by engulfing pathogens, producing antibodies or antitoxins, or acting as memory cells. Platelets are fragments of dead cells and they're responsible for making the blood clot. Plasma is the liquid part of the blood. It carries dissolved carbon dioxide, urea, glucose and amino acids, as well as carrying the cells and also some other large insoluble molecules such as hormones. The human heart is part of a double circulatory system, which means that the right side and the left side function independently to pump the blood to different places. You must remember that the heart is labelled from the point of view of the person whose heart it is. So the left hand side of a diagram is called the right hand side of the heart and vice versa. Blood enters the right atrium from the vena cava, the most important vein which carries blood from the body. Between the right atrium and the right ventricle, there's a valve to prevent backflow. From the right ventricle, the blood moves to the lungs to become oxygenated through the pulmonary artery. The blood returns to the heart into the left atrium, and again, there's a valve separating the left atrium from the left ventricle to prevent backflow. From the left ventricle, the blood leaves the heart through the aorta, which is the biggest artery in the body, and it goes to the rest of the body. You'll notice from this diagram that the left hand side of the heart is much more muscular than the right hand side of the heart, and this is because it's having to pump the blood a much greater distance. Located in the right atrium, there's a small group of cells that control the natural resting heart rate, and this is called the pacemaker. If you suffer from arrhythmia, it's possible to have an artificial pacemaker fitted, which is an electrical device that's used to control irregularities in the heart rate. Health is defined as the state of physical and mental well-being, and ill health can be caused by a number of factors, including communicable and non-communicable diseases, as well as other factors like diet, stress and lifestyle. These factors may interact. So for instance, if there's a problem with your immune system, you're much more likely to suffer from infectious diseases. But also certain viruses like HPV can be responsible for triggering certain cancers. It's possible to have an immune response to pathogens that causes allergies like rashes and asthma. And also if you have poor physical health, then this may lead to mental illness. 
Often while doctors and scientists are trying to figure out what causes a disease, the first step is to look for risk factors. These are things that don't necessarily cause a disease, but there's a known link. Where one increases, the other increases. It could be aspects of a person's lifestyle, substances in their body or substances in the environment. For instance, we know that cardiovascular disease is increased by certain kinds of diet and smoking and lack of exercise. We know that obesity is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. We know that if you abuse alcohol, you're more likely to have liver and brain function issues. And obviously there's a link between smoking and lung disease and lung cancer. And there's a risk for unborn babies if their mothers smoke. Finally, carcinogens like ionising radiation can lead to cancer. Risk factors aren't necessarily the thing that is causing the disease, but they are something that turns up at the same time as the disease. Coronary heart disease is an example of a non-communicable disease. In other words, it can't be passed from person to person because it's not caused by a pathogen. It's caused when a fatty deposit called plaque causes the arteries to narrow. This reduces the blood flow to the cardiac muscle and therefore the oxygen supply to the heart. It can be treated with stents, drugs called statins or a heart transplant and you may be asked in a question to evaluate which of these would be the best option. Remember, anywhere that you meet the word evaluate in GCSE science, you're being asked to compare and write a conclusion. There is always a mark for saying this one is the best and the reason why is. You could consider factors like the dangers associated with surgery, the need to take immunosuppressant drugs following a transplant, difficulties in obtaining transplant organs, the fact that a stent or a transplant is sort of an immediate response but it won't help long term unless you change your lifestyle, whereas taking statins takes longer to have an impact but it does have a long term effect, but then you have to remember to take them. There are lots of things that you could bring into an answer to this type of question. Cancer is another example of a non-communicable disease. It occurs when normal body cells undergo a series of mutations that lead to their uncontrolled growth and cell division. Whereas a normal cell will divide a set number of times before stopping dividing and eventually dying, a cancer cell will continue to divide and eventually begin growing its own blood vessels and just getting bigger and bigger and taking over. When this begins to happen, the tumour can be classified as either benign, which means that it's not considered cancerous because those cells are contained by a membrane and stay in one part of the body, or malignant, which means that the tumour is cancerous and may begin invading neighbouring tissues and forming secondary tumours in other organs. Communicable diseases are those that it's possible for an infected person to pass on to somebody else because the disease is caused by a pathogen, a disease causing microorganism which could be bacteria, viruses, fungi or protists. Bacteria make us ill by making poisons called toxins and they can be killed by antibiotics. Viruses on the other hand reproduce by hijacking our cells and damaging them and that's what makes you feel ill and they can't be killed by antibiotics partly because they're not alive but also because they're protected by being inside your cells. It's possible to treat the symptoms of a viral infection using a painkiller, but these are for treating the symptoms, they won't actually cure the infection. There are three examples of communicable diseases caused by viruses that you need to know about for the exam. Measles causes fever and a red skin rash, and it's spread by inhaling droplets from the coughs and sneezes of people who have the disease. It can be prevented by vaccination, such as the MMR vaccine, which also protects against mumps and rubella. Human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, firstly causes a flu-like illness, but then it goes on to attack the white blood cells and cause an immune deficiency syndrome called AIDS. HIV is spread through the exchange of bodily fluids such as blood if people share needles, or semen through sexual contact. HIV infection can be managed by antiretroviral drugs, but if the disease has progressed far enough for AIDS to begin, then it cannot be reversed. Tobacco mosaic virus, or TMV, is a plant-based virus that causes a mosaic pattern of discoloration where parts of the leaves of infected plants don't contain sufficient chlorophyll, so they're yellow rather than green. This affects growth because the bits of the leaf that don't contain chlorophyll are unable to photosynthesize. It can be spread through the contact of the infected leaves or by contaminated tools, and it can be managed by removing the infected leaves, cleaning tools and also rotating crops. Salmonella and gonorrhea are two examples of bacterial pathogens. Salmonella is one microorganism responsible for causing food poisoning. The bacteria make toxins and these lead to fever, abdominal cramps, vomiting and diarrhoea. It can spread on contaminated food that hasn't been cooked properly or has been prepared in unhygienic conditions. And in the UK, we vaccinate our poultry to try to prevent its spread. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted disease that causes a thick yellow or green discharge from the penis or vagina, as well as pain when you urinate. 
It's spread through sexual contact and can be prevented both by using barrier methods like condoms or by treating the infection with antibiotics. However, antibiotic resistant strains are beginning to arise and this is making the disease much harder to treat. Rose black spot is a plant disease caused by a fungus. It causes purple or black spots to develop on the leaves, which then turn yellow and drop off completely. It can be spread on the spores through water or wind, and it's treated by fungicides or just by removing and burning the affected leaves. Malaria is caused by a protist, and it causes recurrent episodes of fever. It's spread by mosquitoes, which we call a vector. A vector is something that can sort of pick up a pathogen and move it to somewhere else. So the protist spends part of its life in a human and part of its life in a mosquito. What happens is that prior to laying eggs, the female mosquito needs to have a blood meal. So if she bites a human who already has the malaria protist, then she sort of sucks it up and it's in her. And then the next time that she goes to have a blood meal and she bites a new human, she inoculates them with the protist. To control the spread of the disease, we need to stop mosquitoes from biting humans. So either we drain the standing water that they like to lay their eggs in, or we use mosquito nets to avoid being bitten. To protect us against pathogens, the skin acts as a barrier preventing them from entering the bloodstream. And any time that you cut yourself, the platelets allow that to clot really quickly to maintain that barrier. In the nose and in the trachea, there are goblet cells which produce a thick mucus which traps any pathogens that manage to enter those ways. And then there are small hair-like structures called cilia, which will waft the mucusy pathogeniness so that it goes into your esophagus and you can swallow it. So the pathogens that end up being swallowed and going into the stomach are then killed by the stomach acid. If a pathogen does make it past those first lines of defence, it encounters the immune system. There are several different types of white blood cells. Phagocytes engulf pathogens and digest them in a process called phagocytosis. Lymphocytes can produce both antitoxins and antibodies. Antitoxins are responsible for immobilising the poisonous toxins that bacteria can make, whereas antibodies are responsible for immobilising the pathogens themselves. The antibodies are specific to the antigens, the little protein bumps on the outside of the pathogen. So the antibody will immobilise that particular pathogen by grabbing on to its antigens and then it sort of squishes all the bacteria together so that one phagocyte can engulf several pathogens in one go. Vaccination is a procedure to protect us from certain diseases by building artificial immunity in advance of you ever meeting that disease for real. In its crudest form, it involved injecting a dead pathogen, which we call inoculation. But now we tend to inject an inactive version or just purified antigen proteins. The lymphocytes are able to produce specific antibodies based on the antigens that they meet. Remember, specific means they're the same shape, rather like the lock and key theory of antibodies. These antibodies will immobilise the pathogen to allow phagocytosis to happen. Special lymphocytes called memory cells stay in the blood and they remember how to make that particular antibody. If you become reinfected, these memory cells produce large quantities of the specific antibodies much, much faster, and the pathogen is killed before you even really feel ill. You're now considered to be immune to that particular strain of the pathogen. Any question asking you to discuss the advantage of vaccination is expecting you to know that if you've been vaccinated, then when you meet the pathogen for the first time, you'll produce far more antibodies and you'll also produce them much more rapidly, so you may not even develop symptoms at all. When treating diseases, antibiotics can only be used to treat bacteria. They don't work on viruses because these are protected by the cells that they are in. Painkillers can be used to relieve the symptoms of infection, such as if you've got a fever when you have a cold, but they don't kill the pathogens. You should know that while most new drugs are synthesised by chemists in the pharmaceutical industry, many different drugs have natural starting points. Digitalis is a cardiac medicine given to strengthen heart contractions, and it was originally isolated from foxgloves. Aspirin was originally isolated from willow bark, which people chewed as a painkiller in the days before they had access to medicines. Penicillin was the first antibiotic to be isolated, and it came from a fungus called Penicillium, and this was discovered by Alexander Fleming. Drug development is often a really long process, and it's entirely normal for it to take 10 years or more for a drug to come to market. Some of this is about the lengthy process, but also the difficulties in funding drug research and having to write grants to ask for money, and also recruiting volunteers for the clinical trials. Drug testing begins with pre-clinical testing, in which we look for toxicity, so is the drug going to kill anyone, and stability. So if we make the medicine and leave it on the shelf for a month, will it still work at the end of that, or is it really unstable? These tests involve cells, tissues, and eventually animals. 
Then comes clinical testing, all the testing that involves humans. And it's really important throughout this that the person taking the drug doesn't know whether they're getting the actual drug or the control, which we call a placebo. This is a version of the medicine that has no active ingredient, so it could be a sugar pill or a saline injection. And it's also important that the doctor doesn't know who's getting the placebo and who's getting the real drug too, because if they did, they might inadvertently treat the patient differently or introduce bias. This is what's called a double blind trial. Neither one of them knows who's taking the real drug and who's taking the placebo. These clinical tests look for side effects, that's toxicity again, efficacy, does it work, and also dosage. Initially, a very low dose will be given to healthy volunteers to see if they experience any side effects. Healthy volunteers are used so that we're not making anyone who's ill any iller, and also so that if any side effects occur, we know it's because of the drug and not because they've already got a disease that's making them sick. Later, we move on to volunteers who actually have the disease, and here we can look at efficacy. So does the drug actually work and does it work better than the drugs that we already have on the market? We can also look at the dosage. What is the right amount to give to these people? Once the scientists have a large amount of data, this is subject to peer review. This means that other scientists and other doctors will look at it to check that there isn't any bias and to make sure that the data is valid. After the drug is licensed, there's continued monitoring in case new information comes to light or we find out new things that mean it's no longer appropriate for that drug to be on the market. The next few slides are only for the people taking the triple science GCSE biology exams. So if you're taking combined science, then skip ahead until the header stops being pink. Monoclonal antibodies are very specific antibodies derived from a single cell called a hybridoma. The hybridoma is made by fusing a mouse lymphocyte, which makes antibodies, with a rapidly dividing tumour cell. This then allows many clones of the hybridoma to be easily made, all of them producing identical antibodies. These antibodies can be used in the diagnosis of diseases and also pregnancy, to measure the presence or absence of chemicals in the blood, to identify the location of a particular protein in a cell or tissue by adding either a colourful or fluorescent dye to the antibody, or to treat cancer if the antibody is bonded to a radioactive substance or a toxic anti-cancer drug. When monoclonal antibodies were first developed, it was hoped that they would be used for lots and lots of things very, very quickly. But unfortunately, there had been more side effects than expected, and so their use is rather limited. And while we use them a lot for diagnostics, we're not yet using them in all kinds of treatment areas. Monoclonal antibodies are commonly used in diagnostic tests, called lateral flow immunochromatography assays. And these can be used to diagnose everything from pregnancy to whether or not a plant has a particular disease. These testing strips have a sample well where the sample will go and then a testing window where either one or two lines may appear. The first line is there to tell you that the test is actually working and that you don't have a defective strip and the second line is there to tell you whether you've detected the particular protein that you're looking for. So in the example of a pregnancy test, in the early stages of pregnancy the blastocyst produces a hormone called HCG. So firstly, we have one monoclonal antibody which is specific to that protein. In other words, it matches it in shape, like a hand and a glove or a lock and a key. Some of that antibody is placed in the sample well, and as you can see here, it's been tagged with a dye, so it's going to show up as being blue. The sample, in this case a urine sample, is introduced into that sample well. And if it's there, then it will bond to this first blue antibody. Now, our second antibody is specific to the first antibody. In other words, if the first antibody meets it, it's going to catch it and hang on to it. So in the testing window, the first line has lots and lots of this second antibody on it. And so as the antibody comes past, it's going to be grabbed and that blue line is going to appear. So that lets us know that the first antibody was actually present there in the sample well and that some liquid has been introduced and it has moved down the assay. Now the third antibody is also specific to that HCG protein or whatever it is the protein that was looking for in this assay and so that means that if any of that protein comes down it's going to grab that. So on this second line we have lots and lots of that third monoclonal antibody and so if the sample has got the HCG protein in it it will firstly be tagged by the first antibody with the blue marker and then it will be grabbed by this third antibody and that's what causes the second blue line which shows us that there's a positive test.
When plants are infected with a disease or when they don't have enough nitrate ions or magnesium ions, this can show up by stunted growth where they're not very tall, spots on leaves, areas of decay, growths or tumours, malformed stems or leaves, discoloration like chlorosis where the chlorophyll breaks down or isn't made in the first place leaving the leaves looking yellow, or being more susceptible to pests like aphids, which suck the sap from the phloem, leaving the plant with less fuel for respiration because the aphid is taking away the sugar. The disease can be identified with the help of a gardening manual, laboratory identification of the pathogen, or monoclonal antibody testing kits like the ones we just saw being used for pregnancy tests. Plants defend themselves with a mixture of physical, chemical and mechanical defences, including their cellulose cell walls, waxy cuticle on leaves, dead cells like bark surrounding the stem of the plant, antibacterial chemicals, poisons to deter herbivores, thorns, hairs, leaves that droop or curl, and also mimicry. This photograph shows Lamium album, or dead nettle, which has leaves that look like Urtica dioica, the true nettle plant. Animals avoid it because they don't want to get stung, so it doesn't have to waste energy on actually making stinging chemicals, it just mimics the stinging nettle. The final topic in AQA GCSE Biology Paper 1 is bioenergetics, and we begin with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an endothermic chemical reaction used to store energy in glucose, and as you know from chemistry, endothermic reactions absorb energy from their surroundings, and this may lead to a temperature drop, but it doesn't have to be a transfer of energy as heat. Here it's light. The light is absorbed by the chlorophyll in the chloroplasts within plant and algae cells. You need to know both the word equation and the symbol equation for this reaction, and it's really important that you don't mix them up or chop and change. If the question asks you for words, you have to use words. It's also really important with the symbols that you make sure that the numbers in the molecular formulae are subscripts. They're small and they go below the line. If you write a squared sign instead of subscript 2, you won't get the mark. The glucose made in photosynthesis can be used for respiration to release energy for the plant to use. It can be combined with nitrate ions to make amino acids, which can then be used to make proteins. It can be used to make an insoluble polymer called starch for storage. It can be made into cellulose for cell walls, or it can be used to make lipids, which are also used for storage. The rate of a reaction is its speed, and we can measure the rate of photosynthesis by using an aquatic plant and looking at the number or volume of bubbles of oxygen gas that are produced in a certain amount of time. It's really important when you're discussing rate that you mention that you're going to time it. The limiting factor of the chemical reaction is the thing that's slowing it down. It could be a reactant that there isn't enough of, or a condition that isn't optimum. For photosynthesis, the rate can be limited by light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, temperature, or the amount of chlorophyll to absorb the light. When you're trying to identify the limiting factor for photosynthesis by looking at a graph, it's important you know which part of the graph you're looking at. So if we take this light intensity graph, if I split it in two about here, you can see that in the first part of the graph, as I give the plant more light, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And this tells me that light is the limiting factor. However, when we get to a certain light level, the graph plateaus. In other words, it flattens out. And at this point, it doesn't matter how much more light I give the plant, it's not photosynthesizing any faster. So this tells me that something else must be limiting the rate of photosynthesis. Maybe the temperature isn't optimum, or maybe there isn't enough carbon dioxide. The graph for carbon dioxide looks very, very similar. Up to a point as you increase the level of carbon dioxide, the rate will increase. But once we've reached a certain level of carbon dioxide, there's just no point giving any more to the plant. The graph for temperature looks a bit differently because basically as we increase the temperature, this will always increase the rate of a chemical reaction. But because this is a chemical reaction catalyzed by an enzyme, that enzyme will eventually be denatured by the high temperature. In the final required practical of this paper, we look at the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. You should be able to name your variables. So the light intensity is the independent variable, and we achieve this by moving the light source, although I suppose you could also use a light that you could turn up or down. The rate of photosynthesis is the dependent variable, and we achieve this by either counting bubbles or collecting gas within a specific time frame. The control variables will be things like the temperature, the carbon dioxide concentration, and the plant used. You need to make sure that you describe how to measure the rate. You're going to use an aquatic plant underwater so that you can either count the bubbles or measure the volume of gas produced, and you have to make sure that you talk about timing this, so measuring how many bubbles are there in 10 seconds or 5 seconds or a minute, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to calculate a rate. Then you need to describe how you're going to change the light intensity.
So the normal way to do this is to have a light and have a ruler and have a set distance from the plant. And then once you've completed the experiment, move the lamp to a different location, making sure that you give the plant time to acclimatize before you start counting bubbles. Because we're investigating light intensity, we need to make sure that the temperature and the amount of carbon dioxide are controlled. To keep the temperature the same, we could use a heat screen, which stops the heat from the light bulb influencing the plant. You could use an LED bulb because they tend to stay quite cold, but make sure you're explicitly saying you're doing it so that it doesn't affect the temperature. You could also keep the lamp a certain minimum distance away and never let it get too close, or you could use a water bath that remains a precise temperature. Say it's exactly 25 degrees and it's being monitored with a thermostat. You can use chemicals like sodium bicarbonate to make sure that the water is absolutely saturated with carbon dioxide and there's no way that it could become a limiting factor. If you're taking the higher tier exams, then you may be asked in the context of this practical to discuss inverse square law. This basically means that however much you increase the distance by from a plant to a light, you're going to decrease the amount of light that each square centimetre receives by that number squared. So if you move the light double the distance away, then each centimetre squared of the plant will receive one quarter of the amount of light. Also, if you're taking higher tier, you may be asked to explain about limiting factors and how they're important in the economics of the conditions in greenhouses. So basically, to maximise photosynthesis, the light should be permanently on, the temperature should be optimum, as warm as we can have it without the enzymes being denatured, and carbon dioxide is pumped in so that it isn't limiting. However, all of these things cost money. So for instance, we'll pump in carbon dioxide until it's no longer limiting, and then after that point, there's no point wasting your money pumping in any more. Don't forget that all living things, including plants, do respiration and they have to do it all the time, otherwise they would literally die. So you may be asked about the gas exchange that plants do during the night time or the point at which photosynthesis and respiration equal each other. So you could have a graph like this one that shows that photosynthesis is happening lots during the day when it's light, but in night time respiration is still continuing. And therefore overnight we expect that plants will be releasing carbon dioxide, although during the day they're releasing oxygen. Respiration is an exothermic chemical reaction that occurs in all living cells all the time. It's used to release or transfer the energy that's stored in the chemical energy stores of glucose, and organisms can then use this energy to build larger molecules like starch, glycogen and proteins for movement and for keeping warm. You should be able to discuss the differences between aerobic respiration, which uses oxygen, and anaerobic respiration, which doesn't. Aerobic respiration breaks down glucose to produce carbon dioxide and water, but anaerobic respiration in animals breaks down glucose into lactic acid, and in plants and in yeast breaks down glucose into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Anaerobic respiration in yeast is really important in the food industry. It's called fermentation and it's responsible for making the ethanol that goes into beer and wine and also for making bread rise because the carbon dioxide bubbles push the dough up. Aerobic respiration is an example of complete oxidation and therefore it releases about 19 times more energy and has no oxygen debt, whereas anaerobic respiration is incomplete oxidation, releases less energy and leads to a large oxygen debt. If you're taking higher tier, you need to know that oxygen debt can be defined as the amount of extra oxygen needed to react with the accumulated lactic acid so that it can be removed. When we exercise, we need more energy, so we need to respire more. Therefore, the heart pumps faster to supply more oxygen and glucose to the muscles, and breathing rate and breath volume also increase to supply more oxygen. Without the glucose and oxygen, the cells can't continue to respire aerobically, which is the best way to supply them with the most amount of energy. If this doesn't happen, then anaerobic respiration will take place instead, and this leads to muscle fatigue when the muscles fail to contract efficiently. If you're taking higher tier, you also need to be able to describe that the blood flowing through the muscles transports lactic acid back to the liver where it can be converted back into glucose. Thank you very much for watching this summary video for paper one, and I hope that you found it useful in your revision for GCSE Biology. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Science videos, and let me know in the comments if you found it helpful.